So here's my camera, hopefully. Let's see if it works. Hi. Pop Smart in here. Yeah, works. That's great. All right. So I think it's time to start. Sadly, not so many people there, but anyway. Nice to see you, Anil. You're online. That's great. And uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe some people will join a little bit later. No problem. But it will be interesting to you as well, I'm sure. There's a reason why I asked you how much RAM you have in your workstation. I didn't uh, remember how much it is, but you've got 32 GB of RAM, and that's great. You will have huge benefit of this after watching this uh, video workshop. All right, so let's start. Enough of my face, <laughs> and I'll switch to the Cubase screen. Let's start with the Cubase screen. Okay. Hi, Gaz Hunter. Great to see you. Um, welcome is already done, so let's get right into it. You probably have seen a DAW before. This is Cubase Pro 10.5. And uh, in the first track, I have just added a virtual instrument, Superior Drummer 3. And we can have a look at the virtual instrument. That's basically what the main screen looks like. Here you see the drum kit. And uh, yeah, there is a, a little groove that I have here. And I just want to play a little bit of this drum groove. It's basically what everybody would do if uh, you load a virtual drum instrument. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Okay. Now let's have a look again at this uh, screen because there's one important thing I want to show you. It's small. It's in the top right corner. Here you can see how much RAM this virtual drum instrument currently uses. And that's roughly 2.5 GB of RAM. And that's great because it runs on pretty much every machine you can imagine. If you have a laptop with 8 GB, it might run. So that's perfectly fine. But at the same time, there is a problem because Superior Drummer 3 is so powerful that you can only leverage the full potential of Superior Drummer 3 if you have a lot of GB, of RAM, and a powerful computer as well, of course. Yeah, And I want to show you why there is a huge difference between these 2.5 GB and the same drum kit, which requires a lot more. But first of all, one more time, let's go back to the start and just play this one here. And then I will switch to this one here. And this one is exactly the same drum kit and it's exactly the same amount of GB that we use here. The only difference is that this is already a little bit produced. There's already a little bit of levels here, and there's a little bit of EQ going on, and that's pretty much it. So let's just compare these two for a few seconds. I will jump a little bit in at some point. Let's see where we start, maybe there. can already hear that they are different. Yeah? Okay. Doesn't sound bad, but there is one big issue that you might not be aware of, and that is called bleed. <laughs> Instrument bleed. And I will demo you what that means. And I will demo it to you by playing just a little bit of a recorded song. Let me open this folder here. And you will see lots of tracks here. 
whole drum tracks, bass, vocals, guitar, yeah? So there's a lots of stuff going on. And let me just quickly play you a little bit. Let me just remove this. All right. And let me play back a little bit of this. And now we are only drums. And these have been recorded natural drums, no E drums. Yeah. So uh, let me see if I'm able to to show you uh, which one was it. Uh, if I only remember, I think it's this. No, this one here. That's basically the drum kit that you are listening right now. Yeah. And they are still in the process of setting it up, but you can already see a few microphones there, and that's exactly the drum kit that you hear in this song, in this recorded song. Yeah. So let me switch back to the screen, and let's listen a little bit more of the solo drums. Okay. And as you can see, it's, yeah, sounds natural. But what is the big difference? What is the big difference between all those um, natural drum recordings and the virtual drum recordings? And I will show you. Because now I will, for example, just solo the kick drum. You can hear what's happening. Let me just up the volume a little bit so it's easier for you to hear it. Yeah. You can hear some cymbal and you can hear the snare. Let's try here. Yeah. Or for example, in the snare top. Let's see. You hear lots of stuff there, not only the snare, and that's the main difference. So we can already forget about this recorded song here. I just collapse that, and we will have a look at uh, this one here. Here, the same happens, what happens to pretty much all of these virtual drums sample drum libraries that you get. You don't have any bleed. So if you play anything and you solo, for example, the kick out, let me just up it a little bit. Then you hear only the kick you don't hear anything else because there is zero bleed active from 13 instruments total. And that's what never happens with natural drums. Now, why are they so stupid not to enable all the bleed to give the most natural feel possible? And now we're talking because now we're going to this and if I open it, it will be terribly disappointing because it looks exactly the same. What's the difference? The difference is now I use 15 GB of RAM. Because what I did is I enabled all bleed. Everything in the bleed. Yeah. Let me close for a second to jump right into the song somewhere. And open this again. And now let me, for example, the snare tom, I solo it. Yep. 
you hear the bleed from other instruments that are being played. Or let me try the kick out, for example. Let me solo the kick out. Yeah, of course. Of course I can hear other instruments being played because the microphone is not dumb. The microphone will record everything in the room. Obviously, the stuff that is closest to the microphone, it will record the highest level, of course. Yeah, But all the other stuff that's going on in the room is also there. So we should use it. If we want natural drums, we should enable bleed for all instruments. And that's what makes Superior Drummer kind of explode in RAM usage. So don't try this on an 8 GB laptop. Even on a 16 GB laptop, it would be pretty tough to do that because Cubase and the operating system all require some RAM. So you don't have uh, enough RAM left to load this kind of huge kit. Yeah. So there is a problem. And since when they sell this kind of Superior Drummer 3, for example, by the company Toontrack, they want people to be able to use it immediately without issues. If they made all their presets with all bleed enabled, only very few people could actually run these. Or in other terms, many people would run into issues because it just doesn't load on their system. Yeah. So there we have one big issue that many people run into when they use virtual instruments of the quality, for example, of Superior Drummer. Yeah. Because it is massive. It has everything you need. Everything. And uh, let me just try to find the picture. Here's the picture. That's basically the drum kit you are listening to right now. That's the Ludwig Classic drum kit in Galaxy Studios in Belgium. That's one of the greatest studios for recording drums because it's a huge, huge studio room. 8 meters high, 330 square meters of space, and there they set it up with plenty of microphones. A total of 32 microphones for this drum kit. 32. Yeah, It's not 4, not 8, not 12. It's 32 microphones. And we have them all available, readily available in Superior Drummer. We can use them. So, yeah, if we can, then we should. So we are back on my screen, and we'll have a look again at Superior Drummer. And there you can see all this stuff going on here. There's lots of microphones. Some of them are even stereo, like ambience ribbon or surround left right. And all of them go to individual outputs. Now, what's that? Okay, I will show you. Let's go back to this default Ludwig Classic kit that comes with Superior Drummer 3. If we look at the mixer, then you will see there's basically, in this case, it's two faders. There's a reason for that. You will understand that in a second. If you do that, it will be one fader only for a stereo track, and you have one fader there, and you get basically the entire drums as a group, on this particular one fader, in my case, two faders. So when you start mixing in Cubase, for example, you will only do stuff on the group. You cannot do stuff on individual instruments here because you don't get it. You only get the stereo out of the drums, of the drum package of Superior Drummer. So what you want to do now is you go to Superior Drummer, you start mixing here using the effects that, are, that come with Superior Drummer. And at the end, in the output one and two of this particular preset, you get your drums bus. And that's what you use. Oh, sorry, I have to switch the screen. So one more time. So basically, you start mixing here, you use the effects, inserts, or sends, or whatever, to mix your drums here. 
Then you jump back to the Cubase mixer because you want to mix uh, whatever, bass, vocals, something like that. Then you want to do some kind of edits because uh, maybe the snare is a little bit too loud. You have to switch back here and mix here. It's kind of an awkward way to mix because you have to look at two different places and you have to use different plugins because you cannot use the plugins that come with Cubase. There's only a selected choice of plugins that are included in Superior Drummer. Anyway, long story short, we have to do that differently. And that's something that also pretty much nobody knows. And I will show you. Because if we switch back to the mixer view, I am a terrible guy. I have hidden a lot of stuff. So what we do first is we remove these kind of default standard superior drummer tracks. I don't want to see them, yeah? I really don't want to see them now. What I want to see is what I did. Let's see. And in center, front. Uh, there should be more. How can I scroll down? Hello? There we go. And there we go. All right. Now we can hide this. And what we got now, this is everything, individual microphones from the Ludwig Classic drum kit. Whoa. Amazing. Now we see all the drum instruments individually. <sighs> Finally, we can start mixing inside Cubase. Do everything we want inside Cubase. And just for the sake of uh, information, I put up here some pictures of the microphones that have actually been used and the names of the microphones for the individual channels. And you can see, for example, snare bottom. Yeah, has been recorded with a Neumann KM84, which is a cardioid small diaphragm condenser microphone, or for example, the snare top with a Sennheiser MD4 one uh, or it's called Profi Power um, as well. And so you can see what these drum samples have been recorded with. So even for the ambient channels, yeah, we have surround up to, I think, uh, 7.1 surround. So you can even see these all these ambient tracks that are located somewhere in the room of this big studio. You can see which microphones they used. Yeah. Let me just tell you, the total amount you would have to spend to get these microphones here is around 50,000 euro. You don't want to do that. You rather pay a couple of hundred euros for Superior Drama 3, with a huge library of sounds, and enjoy it. Because it doesn't make sense that you try, even if you win the lottery and you can afford to buy all these microphones still, you don't have the room. The room that really sounds great and that supports the sound of your drums, yeah? doesn't make sense to, to put like uh, 4,000 euro of uh, microphones in a basement, in a small or in a garage. You don't get the, the full potential that you could get. Yeah? So there is no artificial reverb or something going on. It's everything you hear is basically recorded sound. So to show you, I will just solo all these. Or let me just unsolo them. Now we're talking. So what we hear now is no direct microphones. These are all more or less direct microphones, including the overheads. I don't I want to listen to only the room, the ambient sounds. So let's just play a little bit. Uh, something went wrong. <coughs> Let me just quickly delete this song. We don't need it now. 
All right, back. Now we listen to everything, all 32 microphones at once. And now let me take down all the ambience. So we only have the more or less direct microphones. Now how about switching snare top solo? Okay, we can push that a little bit. What about the snare bottom? And now let's take in some ambience. Okay. What I don't want to do in this particular workshop here is to show you how to mix drums. It's not possible right now because I don't have a complete song and it always depends on the genre of the song, how you want to fit the drums in the song. So it doesn't make much sense if I start using EQs and uh, compressors and maybe even try to fiddle around with gates. Yeah, if you do kind of a front of house sound, you will likely use gates on a daily basis because a gate will help you to kind of clean up the drum sound. I would not use a gate. Likely I won't use a gate in these particular sounds because it's been recorded in a world-class studio and they are just great. And I want to have the natural feel of the bleed of the sounds from other instruments coming into one instrument because that gives the natural feel. I don't want a sterile, perfectly clean snare with nothing, kick with nothing, hi-hat with nothing, toms with nothing. No, all things work together and I love that and I want to use that. Great. So, how did I manage? to get all these individual outputs out of Superior Drummer. I will show you. Let's go here to Superior Drummer for this particular one. Again, you can see there's pretty much, let me just scroll over, there's all bleeds enabled. All is basically on one level. There's no kind of pre-mix going on. I just want them to, to be available in the Cubase mixer at equal level, at basically the recorded level. I took it down a little bit, but don't worry about that. No pre-mixing going on. All right. <clears throat> In the other default preset, everything went to out one and two, and then you could see it in a stereo track in the Cubase mixer. Now we have a lot more outputs, a total of 32 outputs we have. Here they show as stereo outputs. One, two, are always stereo pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. But uh, yeah, let's have a look. <clears throat> First of all, in Cubase, in the top right corner, let me just move that over a little bit. In the top right corner, there's a small arrow. You click here, and then you can choose activate outputs. <clears throat> usually you only see these stereo pairs so you would see basically 16 stereo pairs available to output but I see 32 mono outputs so how did I manage to do that and that's a pretty easy hack you go to <coughs> setting, advanced, and there you can set mono outputs. So I use 32 mono outputs from Superior Drummer. <coughs> I don't know for sure if this only works in Cubase and Nuendo, or if there's also ways to do that in other DAWs like uh, Pro Tools or whatever. Yeah, I won't comment on the other DAWs, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
Anyway, I use 32 mono outputs, and when I save the setting, I have to restart Cubase, load the project again, and then it will be available exactly the way I want it. So I can basically activate all outputs. I already did that, so this option is not available now. I can only deactivate, but yeah, you will see activate all outputs, and then they are available in the Cubase mixer exactly the way you see it here. They might have gener generic names, so you still have to kind of rename the channels one by one. But if you're really keen on using this technique to mix drums in a much better and much more realistic way and much easier way, then you might want to just take this effort once and save it as a template or save your project and you can re reuse it whenever you want. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's basically the trick, how you get all these microphones out of Superior Drummer into Cubase. Amazing. Woo. Now... Is there already any questions? Let me have a look. Oh, it doesn't seem like there's any questions. Woo. Either I explain well or I don't. <laughs> and people already left. I don't know. Anyway, so that's the way I prefer to mix drums, even though it requires more resources Yeah, in your DAW. Obviously, because you deal with a lot more channels and everything comes from a virtual instrument which requires you to have uh, 15 GB of RAM. That's crazy. But how about we are already finished recording the drums? Basically recording the MIDI. How about making it even one step further? Let's try to make it even more realistic. And that's pretty simple because on this MIDI recording here, I just do a right click. I go render in place, check render settings. And what I want to do now is I only want to render the dry channels. Only the dry channels. So let's hit that, and it will take a few seconds, of course, because it will create 32 audio tracks. And it's pretty fast. Five seconds left. I'm sure it's not too long. So, come on. Calculating the waveforms, of course. All right, so now this channel here is pretty much gone or deactive. We don't need it because now we have real audio tracks and it's still calculating the waveforms, but it's relatively quick, so don't worry too much about that. So uh, let me open this a little bit more so we can see there's actually something going on here. Okay, now let's switch back to the mixer because now things go really crazy. And I have to clean up the mixer view a little bit because I want to get rid of all these MIDI tracks now. And these are the MIDI tracks. So let's get rid of them. I just have to be careful. Yeah. Only the instrument tracks I want to make invisible and the actual audio tracks, I want to keep them for obvious reasons. And now you can see we have our 32 audio channels. The only downside is we lost our notepad information. We lost our beautiful pictures. So it's only the first channels track picture that we see, but that doesn't matter too much because this was 
probably only for you guys. So let me just deactivate Notepad and Pictures for a second. <clears throat> and then I want to show you one more thing. Because if we play back this stuff, yeah, there we go. Beautiful. And don't ask me why these are already changed. Maybe because I tried something before. So let me just reset all this and the ambient channels. Yeah, let me keep it like that. Okay. <clears throat> A few more things I want to show you that you might not know about Cubase is... Um, Ah, one thing I want to show you. Here's basically the VSTi load, the average audio processing load. Yeah, so if you run into issues there, because the processing of a virtual instrument is too much, then this is a good way, like render in place, make audio files, because audio files don't require any processing. They just need a fast hard disk or SSD to play back, but there's l very little processing going on. So what we do now is we get rid of all these instruments. Let's just uh, remove selected tracks. Bye bye. And now it will take a while. Wow. Why doesn't it disappear immediately? That's because we have a total, a total number of uh, 20 or 21 GB of samples loaded into the RAM. Lots of small files. And it will clean up basically all of them before the tracks will be gone. And now finally it happened. And can you see how the audio processing load dropped considerably? There's pretty much no load at all because now we are basically only using audio. Yeah, so there's almost nothing happening down here. Yeah, much easier on the computer now. And you can do, of course, everything you want to do in your mixer. You can use inserts, you can use send effects, everything you want to do. You can even create group tracks or whatever. So that's another tip. If you're done with your e drum recording of the MIDI. Use render in place, get rid of the virtual instrument, save it with a new name, just in case you have to go back and edit something, Yeah, just in case, you never know. So, uh, And then from there on, if you're happy, you can continue working with these audio files. Now Gas Hunter asked me, how do you get the track pictures up? That's pretty simple. Oh. I forgot to switch the screen before. I just cleaned up everything. And here you can see the VST load now is really, really low. So just to recap that, yeah, because the all the VSTIs are gone, the load on the computer is much less. That's why. All right, uh, the track pictures. How do I get the track pictures up? Um, first of all, I always go to the wrong menu. Here is track pictures, for example. So I see them. Now I double click and let me move the screen over. Here's basically the default set of track pictures you can use, but you can go to user and in user you can use import to add any track picture you want to have. It will show you a dialog where you can basically import the, the picture. And now I can just select it. You see how it changed here to the wrong microphone. Let's go back to this one. So, yeah, that's how you can use your own custom-made. I made them on, on white background because it was the easiest and fastest to do, but you can also do them like in transparent PNG, so they look like this. No matter how the background is, they will just be transparent. Okay, but that's too much effort just to show something. Um, can you show me once again how do I export that audio file in the 
directly to project. Uh, yeah, I can, of course, uh, <laughs> if I can undo what I did before. <laughs> uh, let's see. This will take a long time now because it has to load all these VST samples again. So even if it's showing, it's still not ready to use. Undo render selection. So also this one undone. So we can go here. That's basically the track with a superior drummer. I have one MIDI part here one MIDI part, I right click, render in place, render settings, I want to render it dry, I don't want to include the complete signal path, just in case there's already some kind of insert uh, effects or send effects going on, I don't want that to be kind of exported and baked into the WAV files. Also, I want to make sure that the tail size is like 10 seconds because at the end of the MIDI part there might be, for example, a hit on the ride and the ride rings for a long time. Yeah, Maybe the ride even rings for 20 seconds, I don't know, but since it's the end of the song I'm pretty sure that even if I do a slow fade out, 10 seconds is more than enough and that's the reason why the exported WAV files will be longer than the MIDI part because I add 10 seconds at the end for the sustain, for the, for the ringing symbols or whatever, for the room reverb just to go down and disappear. Yeah, so that's basically the render in place option is where you can do that. So let me do that again, one more time, hope that was clear. Great you found it, Gas Hunter. It's really pretty simple. And I think at some point it even asks you if you want to keep these pictures in your user library to reuse them in other projects. Maybe when you save and, and quit Cubase or something, I don't remember exactly, but it will ask you. Not right click on MIDI track, sorry that I correct you a little bit because the wording is important. Not right click on the MIDI track but on a MIDI event. Because if you only click on, on a track, let me just quickly get rid of these and then I will show you the difference. <coughs> when it's gone, it's gone. I will not undo one more time. <laughs> it just takes too long because of this massive sample library that will be unloaded now. And it's not a matter of fast or slow computer. This computer is really slow, uh, really fast. <laughs> I have 64 GB of RAM and it's really fast uh, G um, CPU inside. It's a matter of the amount of samples. You can imagine like 15 GB, that's worth like 20 completely full CDs of audio. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, you think like, okay, one kick hit, that should be only a few kilobyte or something, or maybe one megabyte. How can it be 15 GB for a drum kit? But you have to imagine that there is different velocity layers, there's different positions even, depending on which instrument you play, there's positional sensing, and uh, there is uh, all these bleed files individually recorded, there's all these room microphones, so you end up with uh, yeah, a lot of stuff. <laughs> all right, back to the question. Track, if I select the track, that's what I do. There is the track. Even if this was a MIDI track, yeah, it's not, it's an audio track, but if it was a MIDI track, it doesn't help if I select the track. I really have to select the event. That's an event. 
I can select this event without selecting the track. Now I select the track. Yeah, so this wording is uh, a little bit important. So, yeah. So all these blocks on your tracks are called events. So if you do like uh, lots of bits and pieces, whatever, you can have plenty of events in one track. But make sure if you have kind of a collection of uh, MIDI events here in your drum track, for example, then you really have to glue them together. So you have one event and then you can do this render in place. Oh, sorry, again I forgot to switch to the right screen. So, one more time. Here, this is selecting a track and this is selecting an event. And it works only with events. Right click and then render in place. I can even do it on an audio track if I have some kind of effects there and I want to bake them. All right. So, that's the difference. Track, event. Now back to the mixer. You have stared at the mixer while I explained something different. Sorry for that. Anyway, I want to show you one more thing that some might not know because Cubase is just so crazy with packed with features, really crazy. So if I go here, I can select options to show in my mixer view. For example, these pictures, I don't need them anymore, so I disable them. I don't want to see them right now. Yeah. Let's just forget about the other stuff for now. And now I have a second menu, which is called Racks. And in the Racks, I can select other stuff if I want to see it or not see it. For example, the Pre. By default, you don't see it. By default, you probably only see the routing. Most of the time it's closed. Then you see the inserts, EQ, strip, sends, and that's pretty much it. And you start mixing like crazy. Okay, some faders are all the way up, other faders are all the way down. And as a mixing engineer, or maybe as a front of house technician, you already know that you are always trying to keep your faders at unity level. So it's easier for you to work because if you have a slight movement down here, just like two millimeters up down here, makes a bigger difference than two millimeters up down if you're here at Unity again. So why do I tell you? Because you can activate the pre-section and that's basically the preamp for this channel. So let's jump to this. We have the kick out channel with the audio. Yeah. Now we look at the mixer. Here's our kick out. And the wave file comes in from the top. Kind of just imagine it comes from the top and then it goes through all these things and from there it goes out to the stereo out or wherever to a group or something so what we can do here is we can change the gain the pre gain that's independent of the fader for example my fader of the kick out currently is at zero now let's say i want to have the kick more or less plus 6.5 dB or something like that. And then kick sub all the way down, ba 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 ba. And then this looks completely crazy because each fader is in a completely different place. Yeah. So what a front of house engineer tries to achieve is to have everything at unity for a start and then start working from there. So what we want to do here is basically we reduce the pre-gain to a minus 6.5 and reset this to a unity gain. So we have exactly the same level. We reduced the gain before it goes into the channel strip. Right? So that's pretty nice. What you can also do is like a high cut and a low cut filter. If you want. If you record it without any low cut or something and you have lots of deep rumble in your vocal track, 
like my voice for example is a little bit of rumble then you can already add some low cut here for example at 80 hertz or 120 hertz or somewhere you can already reduce all this low end rumble if you want to yeah to clean up your audio signal and the same for high cut if you have too much stuff going on in the high frequencies and you only need the mid frequencies or the low frequencies you can basically clean up the signal before it goes somewhere you can even flip the phase or flip polarity in this pre section without going into the eq yeah there's also this kind of channel settings and in these channel settings you also have lots of different options and you can access basically the same pre section from here but if you want to have an overview you can activate and open it here and you can see it all the time yeah that's nice as well now one more thing is uh, uh let me just quickly read um my Cubase is 10 Pro and in my right click don't show me any option currently, but thanks for the comment. Uh, yeah, you have to activate that. Uh, let me see if I find that. You basically, when you right click, you don't get this kind of menu, but instead you get this kind of toolbar. Is that correct? You only see these kind of tools. Anil? I don't wait for the answer. It should be somewhere in the preferences. And uh, where is it? In editing, I think. Uh, wow. Where is it? There must be an option somewhere, but there are so many user interface. Screams no. General. No. Where is this right click? Tools. Here, show toolbox and right click. In editing, tools. There's, you have to basically un untick this box because if it's ticked then you get the, the toolbox with all these arrow and scissors and whatever and if you untick it then you get the, the menu where you can select stuff um, exactly you need to change that in the preferences like I showed you just just now so that's not so difficult to do to get your right click menu all right so back to the mixer one more thing i wanted to show you because i still have time you tell me when you you have seen enough <laughs> uh, one more thing that can be really helpful is usually when i play and i just play back a little bit of drums so you can see what's happening in the top basically you get a meter there the same that happens here with the faders, you get a meter there. So it can be nice if you see this meter. Let me see, where is it? It's there. Meter bridge, yeah? And obviously, you can resize it if you need it in a big big format you just open it up and there you have beautiful meters what I want to show you is there is another option there that you might not know but that's sometimes very helpful if you right click in this meter bridge and instead of PPM you select wave and now for all audio tracks you will get this and that's what happens. So you see the activity, the waveform of each individual channel. 
and this can help a lot to see when does a particular instrument kick in. You want to see when it kicks in, yeah? And if I use the... Yeah. yeah? And they all show red because I made all these drum tracks red. Obviously, I can, for example, let's just... Uh, if only I remembered how to change the color of multiple tracks at once. I just can't remember it. It's terrible. Anyway, so now I have made the th first three tracks blue color. Let's switch back to the mixer view. And you can see here on the left, it's blue now. Amazing. And I think I remember now how to make multiple channels. I just have to make sure there is no event selected. Once there is an event selected, it doesn't work. So you have to deselect events. Just select the tracks that you want to recolor. And let's go for the toms. And let's see if we find some nice green. Yeah, there we go. I remembered it. Back to the mixer. You see blue for the kick. There's the snare stuff and there's the toms. And let's play. Okay. And in my current view, I have plenty of channels here. 32 channels total. Obviously, I can zoom. Oops. Uh, sorry. There we go. I can just zoom horizontally a little bit in. And then the waveforms get a little bit more obvious to see. Okay, so that's also nice if you can actually see the waveforms here or you can use the meter bridge just the regular way. Yeah. Okay, let's just make the meter bridge small again. We don't need it so much now because now I want to show you one more thing. What happens, or how do you do if you, for example, uh, let's just assume that, for example, this track here, the snare top track, is a guitar track, electric guitar. We have recorded electric guitar. And I want to hear that all the time. So the routing is perfectly correct. I want to send this to... Let's say directly to the stereo out. Yeah, not to the drums bus, but directly to the stereo out here. And this is my guitar track. But now I want to send it to an external effects processor because I want to send this recorded guitar to, for example, a reverb unit. I don't want to use a plugin. Instead, I want to send it to an external reverb unit because I prefer the sound of this external reverb unit. So what I have to do is I have to split the signal. I have to split the signal. How can I do that? That's pretty easy because you can use QSense. So I activated QSense here so I can see it here. And now, what do I do? How do I do? How is that possible? Let's go to the other screen. Let's go to Studio, Studio Setup. Uh, no, 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 sorry, not Studio Setup. To Studio Audio Connections. Let's go to the Control Room. Now it goes crazy. Activate the control room. Takes a little bit. There we go. And now, look at that. Here we have a cue. 
forget about this VST connect for now. This will be a topic for another workshop. But we can add another Q3 available. So I can use a total number of three Qs. And I want to make a stereo Q. Okay. And there is my Q2. Okay. And now I go back to the mixer view. And suddenly I have two cues showing for each individual channel. And I want to only send the Q2 or the, this guitar track. Yeah, we just assume that it's a guitar track. We want to send it to Q number two. Now let's go back to the other screen. Studio audio connections. Where does this Q go? Currently it's not connected, but we can select whatever output we have, where we have, for example, here Strymon left and right. Yeah, That's my effects units, Strymon effects units. I can route it there, and then what comes back from the Strymons, I can record it on a separate track and use it for mixing. So I can split a signal. I can still hear the guitar on the stereo out of my project, but at the same time, I send it to some output. Ain't that crazy? And that's not all. There's so much more stuff to learn. And I think I've shown you enough. Oh, again, I forgot to switch, I think. <laughs> so one more time. Here now we see basically two cues. And I have made sure that I activate for this. We assume that's a guitar track. We just activate to send it with 0 dB to this Q output to send it, for example, to the Strymon effects and then record the Strymon effects on a separate audio track, while at the same time the guitar signal still goes to the stereo out and we can hear it just plain. Yeah. So splitting signals. You can do up to four splits using these cues if you want to. So that's also great to have and great to know. Sometimes really helpful. And again, the wrong one. There we go. Here it is, QSense, to make them visible. But you need to have um, control room enabled for this. So now I will disable control room because usually, most of the time, I don't work with control room. And that's yet again another topic for another workshop. All right. So I'm pretty sure I forgot some stuff to show and to discuss with you guys. But I think the most important one, and that was the actual topic of this workshop, is how to leverage the potential of, for example, Superior Drama 3, because it can do a lot more than you can, Im or than you have imagined before, probably. And um, what about the bus channels in Superior Drama 3? To be honest with you, and uh, I will not uh, just let me quickly switch. Um, uh, just clean up a little bit. Let me make another new, where is it? Superior Drama 3 uh, track. And Yeah, that should load relatively quick because it's the default Premier Rock 1.6 GB only. So if you go through all these presets, you will see that they are still relatively small in terms of RAM usage. But I have my own here with all bleed, all these basic IOT, Genista, Gretsch, Ludwig Classic, Ludwig Concert, Pearl and Yamaha. All these built-in drum kits, I have them set up with all bleed. But, uh, yeah. 
I use this all the time. And uh, regarding your question, these presets, like this Premier Rock that comes up automatically when you start a new instance of Superior Drama 3, you already see that there is zero bleed enabled for most of the tracks, only for this ambient ribbon microphone, ambient, there's the bleeds active, and a few others on some other channel, but most of them are not active. And here, pretty much on every channel, there is EQ, and they go to buses, yeah, like... Uh, kick goes to a specific bus, then the two snare microphones go to the snare bus, and so on. The toms probably, yeah, the toms go all to a specific toms bus. But I don't do that, because I, if I have to mix a song which uses superior drummer, I really go for the way I showed you before. I don't want to mess around and mix inside superior drummer. I want to have all bleeds. I want to have the most natural drum sound I can possibly get and have all the microphones that are available. Here there are still lots of microphones not even active, not even used, you see. There's quite a few microphones completely hidden or deactivated. So I want all microphones active. I want all microphones to be available in my Cubase mixer. So why should I use drum buses in Superior Drummer? Yeah. If you feel comfortable using them, if you feel happy about the built-in effects you get there, and if you don't mind to kind of flip all the time between the Superior Drummer mixer and then your Cubase mixer for the other instruments, and ah, now in the drums, I don't want to turn down the drums bus, yeah, the, the stereo out of my superior drummer, I just want to turn down the snare and the kick a little bit, yeah, or I just want to turn down the crash a little bit, and there you have to go back to this mixer, and where is it there, and ah, different uh, kind of shortcuts or different places for your mouse and different plugins that are not exactly the same. That's that's not the VST plugins that are available in your Cubase. That's only plugins that come with Superior Drummer. So love them or hate them, whatever. So I don't want to do that. I want to work in my environment and that's Cubase. So I don't go for buses. I route I can even show you, even if we have only one output active right now, let me just, uh, sorry, because the others are hidden, let me just unhide two more, so now you see output one, two, three, four, and five, six, and for example, uh, the kick, I want to send it directly to output five, six, and the kick out uh, to... 5.6, kick sub, also to 5.6, and the snare I want to go to 3.4, and the snare bottom also 3.4, so if I play something, uh, I, let me see if I just find some stupid, what's that? Yeah, so you can see that stuff. Oh, stop, stop, stop. So I skip these groups. I want individual mono microphones in Cubase, and that was the whole point of this, this uh, video workshop, I guess. So that's what I do. All right. Did I miss any other question? No, I don't think so. Yeah, in in my opinion, it's just a way more natural workflow if you make sure that you have each individual microphone of Superior Drummer as an individual track in your Cubase mixer. 
And once you have finished editing your MIDI stuff here, if you ever want to edit, yeah, most of the time, if you can, you do. <laughs> Some timing correction. Uh, get a good drummer, then you don't need timing correction. <laughs> but anyway, when you're finished editing your MIDI stuff, I would go for render in place, get your audio files, and then basically you end up with exactly what I showed you before. Uh, sorry. Um, what the hell am I doing? File, import, audio file, and I want to... Oh, they should already be there because I imported them before. Where is it? Test, audio. Holy crap. Uh, I'm not sure I find all of this stuff. Let's just import these three kick files for now. <clears throat> okay. Reuse, 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 different tracks. There we go. So there we have the three kick audio files. From a real recording, real drums, with a real microphone, in a real studio. <laughs> and if I do the same with Superior Drummer, it will look the same, it works the same, it feels the same, it's exactly the same workflow, no difference. And that's what I want. And that's what I thought might make sense to show you. Yeah. Again, there's only one instance of Superior Drummer now. There's no other VSTIs like synth and uh, and uh, whatever pianos and organs or strings or stuff. And you can see already there's a little bit of audio processing load going on, just because of the Superior Drummer instance, which doesn't even have any MIDI files inside. So let me just get rid of this Superior Drummer instance. It should be relatively quick. And yeah, already audio processing load is much lower. Wonderful. And hey, I have another idea. One more thing I show you before I I wrap it up for today. Um, let's go back to the mixer because there's one more interesting stuff. Here, there's something called channel latency. Let's switch that on, and you will see that none of these channels shows anything in this new field here, the total channel latency. There it shows one millisecond. Why does it show one millisecond here? Let's just, because I see from the blue dot that there is something going on, and as you can see, there is a brick wall limiter, and then there is an instance of FabFilter Pro Q3. And that was only meant to be for me to see kind of the spectrum analysis. Yeah, there is, it's absolutely clean. There's nothing going on in this EQ. It's just when I play back, I want to be able to see the frequency spectrum of, of the audio file. So that's basically all I do here. Now let's just get rid of this and also let's get rid of the brick wall limiter and now it's empty as well okay so what's the point of that the point of that is maybe easy to show but difficult to understand so in this particular channel i add fabfilter pro q3 my favorite my all-time favorite eq and i make it small because I want to see what's going on here. Currently, it doesn't show anything. And this means that the channel latency is still zero. So I don't get any timing issues with this channel. And even if I do something here, yeah, some weird stuff going on here, nothing happens to the latency. And that's because FabFilter Pro-Q3 currently is in zero latency mode. 
zero latency mode has a few disadvantages because you can get um, you can get phase issues. Let me put it that way. That would be a topic for yet another workshop to explain a little bit more in detail what happens if you use an EQ because uh, there are weird things going on if you use an EQ. It's not exactly what you see here in terms of the curve. There's some other weird stuff going on. And if you want to reduce these negative effects of phase issues due to using EQ, you can switch this to linear phase. And once you activate linear phase, suddenly you get quite a bit of latency. In this particular case, 116.1 milliseconds. That's already one ninth of a second. And if I switch this from medium quality to maximum quality, I get a channel latency of 1.5 seconds. So there's already a lot going on in terms of latency. Cubase can basically take care of that. Yeah, it, will, it knows how much the latency of this channel is and it will delay the other channels by the same amount so they still play in sync. Yeah? But there is also ways to use plugins like this particular one in the input channels, not only in the already recorded tracks that you want to mix, but you can do the same on the input channels. So when you start recording, you already print this EQ curve into your audio file, whatever you are recording. If it's vocals, <coughs> it will likely sound strange, but anyway, you can do that. But then you have a problem because you have lots of latency there and that's why it's helpful if you can see what's going on in terms of latency. And if I switch back to zero latency, bam, all gone. So that's what I wanted to show you and more to come in other workshops. I think that was already more than enough for today. And let me just quickly clean up QSense I don't need. Yeah, the other one I need. And where was the channel latency? Okay. All right, let's see if my camera is still working. Or if the battery got empty during the time. No, it's still working. Hello. <laughs> So I think that's it for today. I hope it was interesting for you guys and maybe you learned something new, which you didn't know. I can tell you for sure that this particular thing, like output mono channels from Superior Drummer to Cubase, there, I, I haven't found any kind of video tutorial on that, so it should have been something new for you guys and some other extra stuff came for free <laughs> all right guys i'll wrap it up at this point and uh hope to see you next time and where is my oh i have a lower third so if you want to follow my facebook page you will find me there oh my god a little bit of self-promotion it's not actually promotion because you guys know i don't do any paid work at least not for people and friends in Nepal. I do my stuff for free. All right, enough. And uh, let me kick you out. See you guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye-bye.